Well, I've titled this message, Know Your Enemy. And I want you to know, if you don't know this already, enemy number one is not the devil. Enemy number one is not the world. Enemy number one is sin. Because the devil has no reign or rule over you any longer. The only thing he can get you to do is sin, and that's when you become weak and defeated. The world, honestly, if we incorporate the principles of the world into our life, sin will begin to take hold of our life, and then sin takes us down. Sin is the only card that the devil can play, that the world can play. Sin is our mortal enemy. Sin will take you down and destroy you. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, get you off an exit where it's not easy to get back. You know what I'm talking about? If you've ever been to Connecticut, you know what I'm talking about. All right, I'm telling you, sin is our mortal enemy. And we're going to talk about how sin affects us. I asked a few people this week, have you ever heard a message about how sin affects you? And I got that sound, the crickets. All the time that we've been in church, we probably have never heard a message of how sin affects us. We know it takes us away from God, but it does a whole lot to us spiritually. And so we're going to be in Romans chapter 1 in just a few moments, but before that I need to lay a foundation. Jesus was out there teaching on the streets, okay? I'm going to read a scripture that Jesus actually said out on the streets. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were challenging Jesus. And they were challenging him and saying, hey, was John's baptism of heaven? Okay, you got to track me really close here because this is more like a teaching. Everybody ready for school? School's in session. Ding, ding. If you're here, say here. here. All right, everybody's in attendance. Good, perfect attendance. Jesus is out on the streets and the Pharisees and the Sadducees challenge him and say, was John's baptism of heaven? And just like Jesus normally did, he spun it around and he said, listen, you tell me, was it of heaven or was it of earth? He said, by what, the Pharisees and the Sadducees said, by what authority are you doing all these miracles and these teachings? And he said to them, was John's baptism of heaven or earth? And they didn't answer him. Their knowledge and their wisdom was limited by their human perspective. Their reasoning was skewed by the things that they chose to do. And this is what Jesus said, and I want you to catch this. This is what he said to them out on the street as they challenged his authority. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Just before this verse, he said, John's disciples came fasting. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and, and sinners. And here it is. The foundation for this message you have to under the, understand this before we move on. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. What Jesus was saying is, people justify their worldview by their moral choices. I have yet to meet a person who chose to be an adulterer and a thief and had a worldview that that was going to send them to hell. They, they formed their worldview by their moral choices. And the world would tell us that logic and science and intellect are separate from moral choices and from religion. But I'm here to tell you today, and it's gonna be clearly spelled out here in the Word of God, that your intellect, your reason, your reason, and your ability to perceive reality are directly related to your moral choices. Jesus said, to the Pharisees and Sadducees, you're justifying your worldview by the things that you choose to do, and we all do the same thing. Again, I have not met that many people who decided to live a life that was directly against God, who believe in God and believe in hell and believe in eternal punishment, right? And we all do this. I live my life my way, no matter what my church says or does, this is the way I've chosen to live my life because this is my worldview. The cart doesn't come before the horse. Our worldview and the way that we perceive the world comes from our moral choices. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you understand what I just said, say amen and lift your hands because I want to make sure we're on the same page. Our justification of how we want to live produces our worldview. Please keep this in mind as we go through this message because it's going to make a lot of sense. 
The world would say logic and moral reasoning are not connected to the Word of God or to moral choices. But again, the Word of God is going to spell this out very clearly. That your moral compass and your logic and your reasoning are connected. And you can't have one without the other. It's sort of like the engine in your car, okay? You've got the fuel injector. Imagine that being your heart and the pistons that fire off to drive your car down the road. Imagine that to be your brain. You can't have one without the other. You see and perceive the world and understand the world not just purely through logic, but through something else inside of you, your spirit man, the moral part of you, and one is connected to the other. You with me? Say amen. That's the foundation. So I want to read a scripture from the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. I've taught through the book of Romans several times. Paul, in lawyer fashion, describes what's happening in the world. He describes sin and salvation and the work of Jesus Christ. It is the most exhaustive explanation of what Jesus did on the cross in the entire Bible. There are books and epistles and even the Gospels that explain fragments of the Gospel, fragments of what happened in salvation. But Paul, in chapter 1, says, I want to lay a foundation that you can build upon, Romans. So I'm going to start from the beginning, that we're all under sin. This is where Romans 1 starts. Romans 2 and 3 shuts up the case, an airtight case, that both Jews and Gentiles are under sin. But he starts in lawyer fashion with a very broad view of sin and its effect on humanity. Let me say this before I read this scripture. No one is exempt. It doesn't matter if you're saved or unsaved. Sin's result is it's equal for all of us. It equates for all of us. It relates to all of us. Are you out there this morning? Say amen. So we're going to read in Romans chapter 1 where Paul describes this overarching view of what sin has done to humanity. Are you ready? Say amen. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I'm going to make little notations here. Let me tell you this. Every time we choose to go against God, we suppress the truth. Every time we're trying to shut the truth out, it's not just the world and the national media and everything that's being projected from the, the halls of academia in this country, it's us. Any time we choose to, to ungodliness or sin, we suppress the truth. But know this, that the entire world is, li lives with the suppression of truth. Okay? Verse 19, look at this. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. God's dropped something in the GPS of every human being that has ever graced this planet. He made his reality evident within them. That's why people have this construct of God, whether they be on a deserted island in Siberia, in Russia, or they're in America, or anywhere in between. We have a construct of God because God decided to drop the evidence within us. It's why a five-year-old boy can look at the stars at night and say, God and parents, how did all of this get here? That is God's homing beacon inside of each one of us. Look at verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through the things which have been made, so that we are without excuse. People of God know this, that no one has an excuse. Just in general revelation, not specific spirit-led revelation, just in the revelation of the sunrise and the waves crashing on the ocean and the mountain majesty, that's enough revelation for humanity to be without excuse. That's what the Word of God says. That may be a hard pill for all, all of us to swallow, but it doesn't matter. It's still the truth. Are you out there? Say amen. 21, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. That's thinking. Speculations. Futile speculations is thinking. And their foolish heart was darkened. There they are again. Intellect and reasoning and logic tied to the condition of your heart. 
Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image and form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. When we exchange the worship of God, we'll fall in love with seals and try to save them being trapped on the ice. It'll mean more to us to save an unhatched embryo of an eagle than it will a child that's in the womb. This is the problem. When you exchange the worship of God, it's true. When you exchange the worship of God, the worship of the golden calf, referencing the Old Testament journey through the wilderness, the golden calf, some creature is going, something's going to be in that place of worship. And we've turned it into animals and the planet and everything else, which I'm not against preserving animals, planet, or any of that, but I'm just telling you, it's not more important than human beings or God Almighty. He only has that place. Are you out there? This is happening in real time on our planet right now. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature, we see this, rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. You know, we can worship, I didn't say this, we can worship the human body. We worship beauty in this country like none other. We worship it, it is an idol. Are you out there? Say amen. For this reason, God gave them over to creating passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman, and men abandoned the natural function of a woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing, committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do the things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God. I need to say something right now. I have met very few angry, hateful Christians that are condemning people that are caught in lifestyles or in sin to hell with anger. Yet there's this narrative that all these people are judging and hating on people. I'm going to tell you something right now, and this is not a pleasant fact. The Bible tells us that when we receive Jesus Christ, we pass from judgment to life. The fact that you and I and any other person that doesn't know Jesus is already under, under judgment is something that I cannot help. Yes, there's angry and hateful people, folks. But if you're under judgment, you're under judgment. And that is every sinner. That was me before I received Jesus Christ. I can't blow away the dark cloud of judgment over your life. The Holy Spirit was given to us to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. I can't take that feeling of judgment away, folks. It's there. And I'm going to spell this out even greater in the scriptures if you hate God, you think he hates you, it's not the truth. God loves you and paid the ultimate price for you. If you feel like God is distant and angry and judging you, that may be because you're living under judgment. But I got good news for you. There's a door that no man can shut or open, and that door is Jesus Christ. There's a way out of your guilt, shame, and your condemnation, and there's a way to freedom, and you don't have to live under that cloud anymore. I remember when it was removed off of my life and that cloud of guilt and shame and that 100-pound boulder of sin was on my shoulders. I'm telling you, it's available for all people. Amen? <laughs> Haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God and those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. This is not going to sit well with some people in this room. It's okay. It's going out on the internet. That's okay. If you know that things are wrong and yet you choose to do them and then you applaud people in their sin, that's exactly 2,000 years ago this was written and there it is in black and white ink. I cannot applaud you 
when I know that what you're walking in is going to take you down. It's going to destroy you. You're not going to even know who God is. I can't get happy about that. Sorry. Neither should we. This is a spiritual state of being when we can applaud people walking into the very thing that will condemn them. That's the world we live in today. Anybody recognize what I'm saying this morning? So this sermon is not meant to point the finger at anybody. If there's any feeling that this should invoke, it should be compassion. And for us, fear and sober-mindedness because everything that I'm gonna display or discuss today or share with you today relates to us the exact same. The only victory we have against sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. That is our only hope. He is our righteousness. He is our righteousness and our hope today. Here's the thing you need to know. Every sin is being punished, not in the future, now. Every sin is gonna bring a result. If you sin as a born again Christian right now, you just took an incremental step away from God. You've lost some of your perception of where you're at. You've lost a little perception about your reality. Every sin will be punished. And this is one of the reasons like, people feel like they're under judgment. For the wrath of God is revealed, not future tense, past tense, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Folks, it's like gravity. When you sin, you're going to have some kind of diminished return on your spirituality. You're going to be marginalized in your spirituality. You're going to be knocked down. You're going to be farther from God. The only hope we have is to repent and confess and to be cleansed. That's it. That's it. That's the thing that makes up the difference. Galatians 6 tells us, God is not mocked. You can't just go do what you want. What you do in secret, there's going to be a result and a reward for what you do in secret. Folks, God sees all. My sin, it's not hurting anybody. It's not hurting me. You don't understand what's going on. You've been deceived by the hardness of heart and the deceitfulness of sin. I'm telling you, no one gets away with one single thing in God's economy. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. If you sow to the spirit, you're going to have life and peace, Romans 8. If you sow to the flesh, some level of spiritual death just entered into your life. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. Unless you repent and get forgiveness, whatever thing sin has activated in your life starts to grow. It's like the law of gravity. Actions that don't lead to repentance and humbleness and cleansing lead to hardness, deception, and bitterness. And there is no middle ground. There is no gray area. No one really gets away with anything. God sees it all. Sometimes I think we assume God winks at our sin. We're wrong. We're wrong. When you choose to sin, you lost some of your ability to perceive your world, to navigate, and you're farther away from God automatically, period. Here's the thing. Not according to what the world says, because the world has its realm of logic and reasoning and perception of reality, okay? But according to what God says, when we sin... True reasoning is damaged. Something happens to our ability to perceive our reality and know where we're at. How many of y'all have ever been disoriented? You went to the mall and like they changed the rack around. This is my plight. I'm in the store, I'm like, am I in the right section? Like where am I supposed to be? Where are my girls at? Maybe you've done it when you've dro driven down a street that maybe the leaves fell off the, the branches and you couldn't really, it didn't look like the same road. Anybody else with me? It's like, okay, I'm not on the right street. Where am I? And I've been lost twice in the woods. This is my boast. I've been lost twice in the woods and I claim to be a hunter, okay? 
I can tell you when you get in the woods, you can lose your orientation really quick because that area that you walk in looks different at the bottom of a hill than it does at the top and like which way am I supposed to be going? Anybody do that? Maybe I have some New Englanders. Oh, thank you, you guys make me feel so good. Sin will disorient you to your reality. It'll skew your logic and your reasoning, your spiritual logic and reasoning to know what to do next. That's what it does. Look at verse 21. And this is a sinner's plight, but it's what sin does to people, okay? For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. I think it's really interesting that thanks is in there. If you're really going to be spiritual, thankfulness is such a key element. But they became futile in their speculations, in their thinking, and their foolish heart, their moral compass, was darkened. They're connected. You cannot perceive God's spiritual reality correctly if your foolish heart is darkened and your speculations and your thinking are now futile. We have to do this God's way, right? We have to live according to God's truth. we got to allow him to tether us to the narrow path. And I want you to know something. There isn't a human being on planet Earth that can stay on the narrow path and walk in the footsteps of Jesus in their own strength. You cannot do it. It is impossible. It's meant to be impossible so that we would depend on God wholly, that he would become one with us, that we would stay tethered to the word of God. If we're not doing that, we're in deception. You may be a Christian and you might be walking in deception. Doesn't mean you're not going to heaven, but I don't want to walk in deception and neither do you. If you're not regularly renewing your mind and getting a brainwash in a sense, and I don't mean that in the negative concept, you're washing your brain of all the clutter and all the dark doubt and the sin's result. If you're not regularly washing your mind and renewing your mind, you, you are deceived this morning, I'm just gonna tell you. If your nose isn't in that word and it's not renewed, I'm telling you right now, presently in this moment, you're deceived to a certain level. It's a tough word, but it's true. So these people that are wandering away from God that Paul references in, in Romans chapter one, their thinking became futile and their hearts were darkened. Look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 through 16, but just before we read it, it's basically referencing people that operate from the arena of the flesh that are born again. These are Christians he's talking to. And people that operate from the realm of the spirit and the difference, okay? Everybody with me? So here we are. But a natural man, that is the fleshly man, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Like the word appraisal. You can't appraise your present condition. Where you're at, your perception of reality or your hold of the truth by yourself. You can only do it by the Spirit. You cannot do it with a natural man. Okay? Does that make sense? Likewise, if you operate in the carnal, in the fleshly, in the natural, you cannot take spiritual steps. You cannot figure this out through your, your intellect, nor your great moral character. You have to have it from the word of God. Verse 15, but he who is spiritual praises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that will, he will instruct him? But we have, we can have, if our mind is renewed, the mind of Christ. Paul, probably the most spiritual man that ever lived, said, I don't allow a human court to judge me. Right? I'm not going to let another man judge me. Might sound a little arrogant, but when you get to the heart of it, you understand. He said this, I don't even judge myself. I'm the most spiritual man probably, or one of the most spiritual men that ever, li ever lived. I wrote two-thirds of the New Testament and I don't even judge my own perception of reality, where I'm at spiritually, or where I'm at with God. I only allow God to judge me. I got to hear it from him, because I'll fall into a ditch when it comes to the narrow path. I won't stay on the road. I'll fall away from him. I'll get deceived. Sin will somehow make me cold to his promptings. I need him to keep me tethered to the narrow road. Are you out there this morning? Amen? 
And that is the way of intimacy. If you're growing in the Lord, it's more and more and more dependence. It's not you getting better morally and all of a sudden you, you bring, you're brought to this moral plateau where literally you can't sin anymore. That is not it. it the way of intimacy is dependence. You see, God wants us to be one with him, not as co-pilot, not as silent partner, not as lesser partner. He wants to be Lord, and he wants to be one with you. It speaks of a oneness and an intimacy where he's leading and guiding every step and causing you to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. That's it. Without that, sin has got a hold of you. Even if you can't label your sin, if you're not tethered to the narrow path and the word of God is your sustaining force and the spirit of God is strengthening you every day, you're walking as a carnal Christian today. And even though you might not know it, know it because that's the nature of deception. That is what's happening. You can't do it by yourself. And it was meant to be that way. So our reasoning to actually perceive reality and know where we're at with the Lord and know how to stay on the narrow path, it's damaged every time we sin. Damaged. That's why we need God to renew a right spirit in us, to cleanse us, to create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. I've got to have it daily or I'll fall off this road, I'll drift, I'll come apart from what I know I need to be. God help me. I don't want to be disoriented in my Christian life and be out on the open deep and not know which way to swim. And it can be like that. Look at verse 25. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. How many of you all know that's the definition of deception? Right there, you got it, right? They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Again, this is sinners walking away from God, people getting further from God, but we can do the same thing. Anytime we fall for a lie or we deceive ourselves or the devil tells us a lie, we can exchange the truth for a lie, right? For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Here it is. A lie fit their reality more than the truth. Again, referencing Jesus' Matthew 11 conversation. They're justifying their present moral choices by our worldview that vindicates those choices. And we all do it. Oh, I don't need to come to church every week, even though the word of God says encourage each other every day. It says do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. All this stuff, it needs to be a bedrock conviction that you're gonna get together with believers. You can say what you want and think you can survive out there on your own and you can make it because you're a lone ranger spiritually. I mean, you and Jesus are tied at the hip, but I'm just telling you, you can't do something against the word of God and get the results that God wants to give you. You just can't do it. And I don't care what you tell yourself. I don't care what some TV preacher told you. The word of God stands forever as the truth. And I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to even be a little bit deceived. I don't want to be marginally deceived. I want to walk in truth. Jesus, even as Jesus was in the truth. This is why it's so important for you to renew your mind, like I said, because you will fall into a ditch of deception and you don't even know that you're falling into the ditch. This is the human existence. The heart is wicked above all things. It will stray like a wild horse all by itself and you don't even have to work at it. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Like gaining weight. It's not a lot of work to gain weight. This is all I gotta do. But losing the weight, how many of y'all know that's like the hardest thing in the world? We can exchange the truth of God for a lie when sin gets a hold of us. That is the definition of deception. Let me just tell you, there is an enemy called the devil who will jump in on the fact that you're deceived and tell you, you don't need all that, you don't need to do this. You don't, yeah, He'll just jump right in there and push you right down that road. This is something I found out about the devil. If we're running the wrong, wrong way, he's never going to put up a sign. He's going to put some wind at your back and get you to keep running and push you a little bit. I'm, I'm being serious with you. You got that new job and don't have any family time. You know what? He's like, hell yeah, don't. Just load him up some more debt. Make him go to work even more so he doesn't have a relationship with his family. This is what the devil does.
Hebrews 3, 13, but encourage one another day after day as long as it's still called today. That means this is a daily thing, like the heart wash that we need, the brain wash that we need. It has to happen daily. You get soiled every day with dirt and sweat and dust or whatever. You take a shower every day. It's the same exact thing. It's a daily thing. Why? Here it is. The Bible says daily so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There it is. None of you. Like we have to be washed and encourage one another daily. Now, the first service, their personal hygiene was immaculate, I think, because of the way they responded. You don't go out of, out of the house without brushing your teeth. And if you do go out of the house without brushing your teeth, you're like talking to people like this. <laughs> right? And maybe it's not 100%, but we can get there. If you're not here on this, on this page with Pastor Chad, come meet me. We'll talk about this. But we put deodorant on every day. Or we should. So that, you know, John 11 doesn't become a reality in our life. Surely he stinketh by now, you know. With, anyway. Why do we do that in the natural, but we don't do it in the spiritual? Like, we think we can go throughout this world and, and not be soiled by our attitude. Or gossip comes out of our mouth and infects us. Or we have a bad attitude and we don't get any cleansing, we don't get washed, we just go out with our dirty, nasty self again and think that God loves it and we're getting closer to God. We're wrong! We need to be cleansed daily. We need to renew our mind daily so that we can understand this is the narrow path. This is the path everlasting. This is the road that God wants me on. Man, he better keep me with his word. He better hem me in with his angels. He better keep me by his spirit because I can't stay on it. Listen, I love you when I say this. If you don't understand the reality I'm speaking of right now in your Christianity with your intimacy with God, you're not close to God and it's okay. But come aboard with the level of dependence that will keep you on the narrow path. Sin will beat you every time without that. And then as it progresses, we're going to talk about a way of thinking that is truly broken. And listen, my compassion I talk to people about their faith all the time. I've discussed and debated people that I know are no more saved than a ball on high weeds. I have talked to people and discussed and debated these things, and it does not invoke any kind of pride in me, only compassion and brokenheartedness. But this is the reality of what people are walking in in our world today. And folks, we can walk in the exact same thing if we're not careful. We can have a ticket to heaven, but we can be living like hell. Folks, I'm telling you, we can be deceived without the word of God in our life. Verse 28, 28, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Everybody look at me. They lost the knowledge of God. They lost the truth. And degrading passions ran in. Again, your intellect and your, re your reasoning and your perception of reality are affected by your moral choices. All of a sudden, God isn't on the throne of your life and passions run in, degrading passions. And those degrading passions get you to the place like the children of Israel that begged God for, to feed them with quail. He said, listen, I'm feeding you from heaven, but if you got to have your lustful desires filled, I'll fill your mouth with a quail. We do the same thing. When we exchange the worship of God, God will go ahead and give us the very thing that we want so bad just to teach us, hopefully in compassion if we repent, that it's not worth it, that it'll never bring the right result. So when God gives somebody over to depravity in their thinking, I want to tell you something, you can't trust a single word they, can't, they say, nor the spirit behind it. I don't care if it's the national media, a politician, even a preacher. If they're in this spot and degrading passions have run rimshod over their life, you can't trust one iota of their reasoning. Now listen, they could still put together two plus two and equal four. But when it comes to perception of reality, knowing spiritual things and navigating their life, spiritually appraising things, they got nothing. Nothing. And we can get to this place too, folks. 
Now that you've been born again and God has chased off all your demons and gave you victory over sin, you can't let the entanglements of the world come back in or the state, your former state, was not as bad as your present state. When you allow the things of this world to take a hold of your life again, I mean, it's gonna be a long road, hard road back. The condition of your life is worse than it was when it started. That's what the Bible says, folks. And God can give us over to some funky thinking, trying, as born again Christians, trying to get us to run our head against that wall to realize that that's not the way to go. And here it is, I love the NIV version. Not a real big fan of the NIV in most cases, but in this particular instance, man, it really nails the heart of this verse. Ephesians 4, 18 through 19. For they are darkened in their understanding. That's your logic, that's your reasoning, that's your perception of reality. They are darkened. Every person that you know that's unregenerate, that doesn't have the Spirit of God lit up inside of them, is darkened in their understanding, they're perceiving this world through a veil. And we can do that too, I don't wanna be that person. I wanna walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. And separated from the life of God because of the ignorance. That's a state of being. When you're separated from the life of God, you cannot navigate this world and there's a certain amount of ignorance that takes over. That is a mental state of being, you're ignorant when you're separated from the life of God. Get it? You understand? Do, right, to the hardening of their heart. So their mental facilities, and our mental facilities are affected by the condition of our heart. Remember the pistons and the fuel injection, they work together, you can't have one without the other. The world has told us that logic Science, academia are completely separate from moral choices, but it's not true according to the word of God. Your engine, the moral compass that you have, and your intellect and your reasoning, they are tied together. And if we're walking in the light, we will see things clearly, but if we're walking in sin, our foolish heart will be darkened, and our reasoning will cause us to walk in ignorance. Christian, this is what sin does to us. Verse 19, I love it. It's absolutely 100 spot on. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality. Listen, if you don't have a hold of the truth and the light, guess what's coming in? Sensuality, impurity, greed, and lust. And you can't see the forest from the trees if that's your life. That's what's happening, people. People that don't walk in the light are overtaken by lust, impurity, and greed, and they see the planet through the glasses of their lust, their impurity, and their greed, and they're never gonna be on the same page with us, no matter how well we explain it, because we walk in the truth, because the truth was delivered to us, we're not better than them, but how in the world can the can truth be reconciled with a lie, and darkness with light? It can't happen, it can't happen. So when our reasoning and our moral choices take us out of the will of God, other things are gonna come in. Jesus said Israel is like a house that had been swept clean and in order. And then seven spirits came back. Like once the house is in order and clean and you see things properly, don't let a devil in hell or your own flesh or anything else deceive you into anything else but the narrow path, the truth of God, staying on the right road that Jesus laid out for you. Come on, people, you know what I'm talking about this morning? So I added one scripture to this message last night because everybody hear me. When you get disor- disoriented out in the wi- woods or maybe your GPS isn't working and you get disoriented when you're driving out there, You need something to point you in the right direction. When we sin, we lose some orientation to God. We lose some orientation to where we're at with God. We begin to suppress the truth in our own life with unrighteousness. How do you know what true north is? How should you think the moment after you sin? 
because deception, maybe the devil, maybe your even relatives are trying to convince you to go down that road, your own flesh is telling you, how should you think in the moment when there's a torrent and a tumult of your feelings, your emotions, your pleasures, your desires, the devil and everything else? You need to know what to think in that moment. Well, here's the good news. The word of God tells us what to do. Here's the first thing. You can know this. You already know this. It's something you learned in Sunday school if you were there. First thing you need to do is keep a short list with God. You know, anybody who says they're not a sinner, 1 John 1, is a liar. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We will walk in the light as he is in the light, as he cleanses us. Keep a short list with God. If you did something to separate yourself from the mind of Christ and God's will, get to the altar, repent, turn around and go the opposite direction with all your might and let the Spirit of God empower you to do it, right? That's the first thing. But sometimes, before there's an action, there has to be a thought. You have to navigate your life from truth when the deceitfulness of sin and sin takes a hold of your feelings and confuses you. I want to give you a practical example of this. I've had people come in the church that got born again. I mean, they gave up cigarettes, swearing, adulterous relationships. They came down to the altar like, man, God's just... And they had that one thing they couldn't give up right away. And even though God delivered them from all those things in the altar, that one thing, and the devil lied to them and said, you know what, that doesn't work. For some of you under the sound of my voice, you've been struggling with the same sin, not for months, maybe for years, and the devil or your flesh is whispering to you and telling you that it doesn't work. Can I tell you, never navigate your life from the devil's whisper nor from the area of your flesh or your weakness or even your failure because none of those things are going to get you out of the mess that you're in. You know what's going to get you out of the mess? The promise and truth of God. When you get disoriented, you get confused, and the tumult of your sin and your bad choices and your feelings are throwing you back and forth, to and fro, I want to tell you, there's a verse in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verse 11, will tell you how to think when all hell breaks loose against your life. How many of you all want to know the truth of God's word this morning? I'm telling you, it's good stuff. Romans 6, 11. After you've sinned, after you failed, the moment after you repent, this is the way that you're supposed to think about yourself. Not according to your feelings, your failure, your mistakes, or what people tell you, or the devil's whispering in your ear. Even so, consider yourself dead to sin and alive unto God. That is who you really are. It doesn't matter if you failed 10,000 times, that if you've come down to the altar for the same sin for a decade, I want to tell you, if you're a child of God, when you get up from that altar, it's still true today. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive unto God and that promise will get you out of the mud pie of your sin out of your mistakes and your failures it will pull you out you want to know how to think when you're deceived and listen when you're in a bad situation you got to think clearly don't go to your feelings don't go to your own logic logic go to the word of God consider yourself dead to sin and alive unto God Come on, church, stand your feet this morning. I didn't say this in the first service, but I believe it with all my heart. Some of you are trying to departmentalize your sin. You're trying to keep it behind closed doors so it doesn't affect other people. I'm telling you, God is not mocked. Every time you diminish your walk with God, when you choose to go on in unrepentant sin, you're getting farther away and your logic on what you're supposed to do to get back to life in God on the narrow path is being damaged. Every time your thinking and your heart's desire to go the right direction are being diminished, you can't mess around with sin. You can't hold the rattlesnake by the tail and not get bit, folks. Now we see in these scriptures the gradual slope of sin that takes an entire populace of people away from God to eternal punishment. I mean, if it can work on all those people, it can work on us. But here's the advantage we have. We've been delivered. We've been set free. We're no longer slaves to sin. We've been cleansed. 
We have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have all of these advantages. No longer should we play patty cake with our sin and our mistakes and act like it's not hurting anyone. We need to really take it for what it is. The thing that can destroy us. This morning, if you're like, man, I've probably handled my sin the wrong way sometimes. I came down to an altar and said I was sorry, but I didn't change anything. Nothing really changed. I thought I repented at an altar, but nothing shifted. I'm still struggling with the same things that I struggled with years and years ago. Can I tell you? Here's the answer. God wants to be one with you. He wants his love to fill every crevice and every crack of your life until your desires no longer have any rule or reign over your life. Galatians tells us this. Don't let your freedom in Christ be an opportunity for your flesh, but through love serve one another. There's the answer. The love of God being found inside of you until your desires, they're gone. Your desires no longer have a rule and reign over you. You walking on the narrow road, being tethered to the word of God and the spirit of God because you know it's your only life support. You stay on that narrow road and you don't take one little variant step off of it. You don't diverge one step. You stay there because you know that's the place of life. And your master, your savior will so gladly walk with you intimately speaking to you, whispering to you, leading you, prompting you every moment of every day. He wants to walk with you and talk with you and stay one with you. And listen, when you do that, you're going to step over your sin like a child of God and a daughter of God should. You're going to step on the very thing that's trying to destroy you and keep you away from God. Child of God, if you're here today and it's like, man, maybe I played patty cake with my sin or I didn't understand how sin can destroy me or whatever. But I decide this morning I'm going to stay tethered to the Spirit and the Word. I'm going to stay on that narrow road and I'm going to ask God every day to keep me tethered to that narrow path. If that's you, I want you to throw your hand towards heaven in this place, Christian. I got both hands raised if I could and keep the mic and I'd raise both feet too because this is the narrative and story of my life. I I found out how heinous sin is and I'm still finding out how bad it really is. And I've decided this life of dependence is the only thing that can set me free. Father, I thank you for all these hands that are raised. God, these sincere loving people that love you and love your presence and love your word. God, would you graft our spirits and our hearts and our determination to your narrow path. God, I pray. Father, we would not waver. God, we would not fall to the wayside and forget your ways. God, but we would quickly repent and lay our lives before you and have you cleanse us once again like you've done thousands and thousands of times. And you planted our feet on that path once again and said, Son, I breathe on you to begin again. Father, I pray we would never leave the narrow path. God, we wouldn't diverge from the narrow path. We'd never leave the path everlasting. We would walk in your footsteps, Jesus, today. Every one of your children, under the sound of my voice, God, I pray, Father, that their purest desire, their purest devotion would be activated, Father, to stay with you. Not according to their own logic or their own reasoning, God, but according to your searchlight that searches every part of our soul. Father, I thank you for people being one with you and being intimate with you today. From this place forward, in Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said amen. Come on, if you receive it, say amen this morning.